uh, what's kind of introduced to this otherworldly um, body of work that gave me entry into another mark, you know, in the in, in mark digital zone. Um, so, I, first of all, I just want to um, shout out, give you a shout out, and much respect for bringing this evolutionary idea that we're surrounded with um, to fruition. And, you know, based on our previous conversations, we could, I, we could spend like hours uh, talking um, based on that and the collaborations that we've done. Um, but however, tonight we're going to spend 30 to 40 minutes talking and then we're going to open it up to hear your, your questions. And um, where I want to begin is kind of going from the general to the particular or to the specific and eventually I'll kind of get to my questions that are like, what the hell is this? <laughs> you know, the, um, because I really do feel that when I walked into this exhibition, uh, there were things that I was like, whoa, you know, where did that come from? And so that's, that's kind of where I want to start with like what we see on these walls, what we see and hear on the digital uh, screens. I want to hear you talk about uh, where that comes from. And I know that you're, from talking to you, that your mental map of the cave is very, very expansive. And I want to make sure that we kind of get to some of the locations on that map. So I'm going to ask you three different questions about that, um, that mental map. And the, the, the first one, uh, that maybe you can even link to the Bronx, <laughs> link to the Bronx, is, um, you know, how did mythology lead to, to, to this and what's the connection there? Wow, so so kind of the the real way that this all links together is um, so I would say back in September, uh, even as, as Lori kind of talked about, I had the opportunity, I was pretty much asked to do this show. And um, leading up to that, the show was originally supposed to open in September of 2018. Um, and as I kind of started working on stuff, I really just kind of, I just didn't feel like it was up to par with kind of like having the opportunity to do this show and have this space. And so I kind of like, I reached out to y'all and I was like, can I get an extension? Like, I really just feel like I'm searching for something. Um, and kind of like uh, randomly as I was like getting ready to get on the plane to go to Japan where I got a lot of the scans done, uh, where I got all of the scans done for this show, uh, I randomly just grabbed a book of Greek tragedies, and I was just like, I'm never. I, it was a book that I got like at a yard sale or something like that for like 25 cents, and it was just something I got like years ago. I had stashed away, and I was just like, all right, if I'm ever gonna read these, it's gonna be like on this, on this whatever like 12 hour flight that I have to take. Like this, this is the best time to do it. Um, and then, so I did it. So I grabbed the book and I started reading them. And as I'm reading them, I'm like, like, when was this written, right? Because like, it just didn't make sense to me that everything about it felt so real. And so one of the kind of like, I guess like, um, aha moments that I had was, um, I was reading Prometheus and there's a piece of the show um, that's titled after the play Prometheus. And in the play, essentially, like, a god is chained and, like, locked up and punished for bringing people far, right? And so um, there's a scene, essentially, where the messenger god Hermes comes down and the messenger god's like, look, if, if, if you just apologize, then you'll be free. And Prometheus kind of looks back at him and he's like, yeah, but, like, I'm more free being locked up here than you are on Mount Olympus listening to Zeus. And for me, like, so, like, I grew up around, like, a lot of, like, five percenters in the Bronx. And five percenters are a very particular type of brother. If anyone <laughs> had the opportunity to kind of meet these kind of people, it kind of is an offshoot of the nation of Islam. Um, and they're very, like, heady people. And with that being said, there's a saying that a lot of them have where it's like, you know, you can lock my body, but you can't trap my mind. And so, really, like, just, like, immediately, that concept just, like, resonated with me on a very, like, real level. I was like, I've heard this so much before. 
Um, and so after that, I just was like really interested in this idea of like timeless knowledge and just things that can kind of like last forever. And then I immediately was like, I, I, this is thing, I think this is where I want to go with this show. Um, so that's where kind of like the tie to mythology comes in. Um, it's really just me kind of like seeking things that have been around for a long time. I think about a lot of even like these oral traditions. Um, and yeah, that's kind of how it, how it happened. So Prometheus was um, punished um, for, for, for stealing yeah. the light. Yep and providing yep. the light to the mortals, or mm -hmm. I like to say the masses. Yeah, you know? the masses. Um, but uh, could you talk about the influence there, you know, the, the, the questions of light and flame and what um, that represents and how it reflects itself in your work? So, well, okay, so even the title of the show, The Cave, mm -hmm. right? Um, the Cave is an, is an analogy that Plato creates where essentially, um, there are prisoners who are who are chained and they're prisoners for life. So the only thing that they know um, are essentially the images that they're shown, and the images that they're shown are essentially shadows, which are created once again using light. So um, and in this in this kind of like analogy of the cave, um, one of the prisoners they can break free. They go outside. They see real light and kind of like knowledge, understand the world. Um, but then when they come back and they try to convince other people to leave the cave, people are so like kind of like frustrated and taken aback by this idea that in some tellings of this story, um, that person is then killed, right? So it's once again, I think, kind of this idea of also thinking about something like knowledge or even thinking about something like mythology. I think today, um, like being a black person, like being even like a heterosexual black man in this world, I think today, it makes me think about like, should I connect with something like this? Like, it, there, there's a lot of problematic themes there. Like, how do I think about this knowledge for myself? And what's that gonna mean as I present that to people as well, if it's true to me or not? So I think it's also a lot about kind of dealing with a lot of those dualities as well. So you wanna think about like this piece behind us, um, which has kind of gone through different names over the years as I've used this print. I originally created it and titled it G print. Um, and what is it? So the reason, was just to kind of like like gangsters, like okay. uh, just like G unit, just G random G things that I kind of like like to like reference, kind of like slyly. Um, but all of those are different um, sets from like um, Blood and Crypt games, right? And so those were kind of like the original groups. So you have like the neighborhood '60s Crips or like the 1600 Blood Crips. But um, when these groups were formed, they were really formed as civil rights groups. Right? And they were formed as like community organizations and later they became, you know, criminalized and they became militarized at the same rate that the police did. Right? So it's like when you kind of look at the fact that tanks started rolling through their neighborhoods, so then they started buying AKs, it makes a lot more sense in like that way. So um, I think being kind of being able to also I think except for myself like that's the truth that I see and like that's kind of the light that I want to bring back to the cave you know whether I kind of like get killed for it or not it's kind of how I see that um, being played out in a lot of these pieces yeah and I, I want to dig a little deeper on that the duality that you referred to in this question of these kind of like multiple realities right mm -hmm. because that's what's fascinating when you uh, read the text I mean the apology of the cave, and you see that you know you have these people uh, imprisoned, lined up, looking at images that are actually a reflection, you know, from the flame and the fixtures that are being held in, in mm -hmm. front of them, and that their heads are are stagnant. They can't turn their heads. They can't turn their body, and so that's their reality. Yep. I mean, that's what's, that, that's what's fascinating about it. So yep. I want to kind of come back to that. But I mean, first, I just want to kind of share some of my favorite um, um, lines from that, that text. Uh, one of them is, how could they see anything but the shadows if they were never allowed to move their heads? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. In a digital world, 
where people are not looking at something that's fixed, right? Or, but there is a digital representation of the, those shadows. So that's something I want to um, um, talk to you about. And then just one other from Prometheus Baum, which is another one of the sources that you talked about influencing this, this, this work, you know, in the conversation that we've had that, you know, where Prometheus is neither in insolence nor yet in stubbornness have I kept silent. Um, it is thought that eats my heart and all mortals suffered, right? That the mortals suffered because they had not been given the light and the flame once they were fools and I gave them power to think. And, you know, and this is this is very relevant to what you were saying and looking at this text and saying, when was this yeah. written? Exactly. What, in the fifth century or something? <laughs> um, so uh, again, pulling this together in this modern context mm -hmm. is uh, pretty, pretty astounding. So to get to this question of the realities, you know, these competing realities, um, you know, I, I want you to kind of elaborate on what competing realities you see um, today. What is the flame? Yeah. Um, you know, what are the shadows in the in the cave, in our cave? Yeah. So, so to me, I think there's a kind of like my biggest kind of once again duality but it's like um as much as i like love technology there's like also this thing where like i always tell myself like social media is not real yeah. right and i think that um for a lot of us it's also kind of hard to like remember that and understand that as well and so i think in a lot of ways like the cave that a lot of people live in is a cave of like social media and the algorithms that they're forced to kind of understand the world through, right so when we think about even like the fact that like really even with like the russians and trump right like what they were interested in were like black memes right like they were actually interested in hacking black culture because they understood how powerful like these silos are and how like really how important these languages are so um for me for someone who's like constantly working in technology even producing these pieces using this technology and like being very connected to it, uh, I think there's some sort of, I think I also feel kind of maybe like a lot of guilt around it as well, because like so much of it is something that I am able to kind of take a benefit from, and then also kind of have to like step back and also understand like how dangerous they are for people that don't necessarily understand what they're dealing with, right? So um, to me it is fire, right? And I think like, like um, I have like a lot of, so I have a really large family and like a lot of my like little cousins who are between the ages of like, let's say like 12 and 16, they really, I mean, they actually value like a lot of independent sources on YouTube, like there's something that's vetted like NPR. Um, and for them, they really don't see a difference kind of in between these messaging. And I think very quickly, you can find yourself being in a cave that way, um, where you're kind of shown these shadows and these images that are not real. Um, but that's your only reality. That's the only thing that, that you understand. Um, and today, there's like billions and billions of those, right? It's kind of like, um, like it, it's like once you get into the rabbit hole, you're actually kind of, it's, it's harder to get out than anything else. Like, I mean, you would literally have to start clicking through the opposite kind of content in order to start to balance it out. Um, so inevitably, we're all also kind of forced into these things, whether we like it or not. Um, so. Yeah, well, I know how important family it is, is to you. And so it's fascinating to hear you talk about that, not just in relationship to the abstract, right? Like, we all know that these are issues. Um, this whole question of what is real and what isn't, I mean, people are really posing that question, even coming up with courses um, to train students in how to distinguish from what's real and what is bullshit, basically, <laughs> or made up. Um, so it's one thing to see that on, in the abstract on a kind of society-wide level, but I mean literally to see it in relationship to your cousins and nieces and nephews, yeah. that type, type of thing that really kind of brings it um, to how realistic and how real it is. And uh, this was a question I was going to you know, pose later in relationship to moving from the general to the specific, but I'm going to ask it now. And that is about this piece here, Grandma's Hands. Um, so many of you may have seen this. Feel free to get up and look at it. Yeah. You know, um, this is, to me, this is 
this is one of my favorite pieces in this um, exhib ex exhibition. Um, and, you know, it just, it jumps out at you. But what I love about talking to an artist about a specific act that they've taken, about a specific thing that they've produced, is hearing the backstory. And uh, because I think often you can't necessarily gather what that backstory is depending on where you're, you know, where you start, right? Um, as an observer of the art. So um, to me, the backstory behind this image makes it even more engaging. And I'd like you to kind of talk to us about that, starting with the tulips and the palms um, and how they, um, how they came to be superimposed on your face <laughs> in this image. So, um, so this, so kind of the way that this all came together, um, like this piece, all of it is kind of like really kind of mind blowing in a sense. Because the first thing that happened really was when we were in on the show, we look around, we kind of start hanging everything, and Yara looks at me and he's like, "We need something that's green." <laughs> and I was like, "Okay." Um, and this is like the Thursday, really before that we open up on like Saturday, and then he's like, "Yeah, yeah, we definitely need something that's green." Do you, like, he was like, you should really make a garden. And I was like, okay. And then he was like, or something that's like a super close up of your face. <laughs> and I was like, all right, all right. And then, um, and then I kind of just started walking around. I think like I went back to the museum for a second and I started walking back home. And then I call Yaro and I'm like, and, and oh, the wait, the last thing that he says to me before I leave is, but only make it if it makes sense. <laughs> That was the last thing. He was like, if it doesn't make sense, don't just make it. Because then that's nothing. Like, it has to make sense. So I was like, oh, wow. All right. So finally, when I'm walking back home, I'm like, y'all, I got it. It's going to have, it's going to be green. It's going to be a garden. And it's going to be a close up of my face. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I'm so excited. Send me screenshots as you work on it. So that was kind of the process of kind of working through it. Um, and why I made it. So, so that's like part kind of like one of the structure of how it happens. So as I kind of started thinking about the piece and what it was, um, so Grandma's Hands is a song by Bill Withers, um, which is um, which is also sampled a lot in hip hop and it's like hip hop and like rap culture is something that's like super important to me uh, as well. And it's kind of like a theme that kind of just weaves through how I put this together as well. Um, and so that kind of felt good, like thinking about this song, thinking about Grandma Scans. Um, my grandmother coming from Haiti was um, really her way, in, in my opinion, and kind of something that I saw, especially um, with her recent passing and having the opportunity to look at a lot of the just documentation that made up her life. Um, she was, her way of connecting with that home and where she grew up was by having a really luscious garden, right? Um, and so that's where the tulips come from. Because um, even though we were in like Queens, New York, and half the year it was like way too cold to grow everything, um, every year she always had like the most magnificent garden, like on the block, on the front yard and in the backyard. Um, and that was a huge part of her identity. Um, and then kind of relating back to a lot of the themes that I was thinking about with the show and the idea of the cave once again, um, when I was with one, of my, with, with one of my little cousins, we were kind of talking about it and I was kind of like playing with them and I was like, yo, like, do you like, like, do you like to go outside? Like, why don't you just like go outside, like, like, just do something, right? And, um, As opposed to just looking at just screen. Just looking at his, like, iPad all day, right? And then he was definitely playing Fortnite and like nonstop. And I was like, all right, look, you, you're already the best. Everyone in the house knows you're the best. Just like chill out, just like go outside or something. And um, it was just interesting about like how much he kind of like was like, no, like I'm, I'm good. Like I have kind of like everything that I need right here. And on the screen. On the screen. And like very much like in my childhood growing up, like I remembered feeling like that, but I think I was kind of at the point, like, like for instance, like I have references like basketball and stuff like that, um, which was a sport that I was like terrible at. But 
like my family like forced me to play. It was just something like I dreaded going to practice. I dreaded every game, but I just understood after a while that like, oh, okay, that's how life kind of is. Like there's sometimes you just have to do something that you don't want to do and you have to get through it. And it was just about kind of like, like seeing that and kind of being frustrated that like they weren't acting like that, I guess in a sense. And so I kind of made the comment. I was like, "If do you want to go anywhere? Like, where do you want to go? Like, what are you interested in doing?" He was kind of like, "I don't have to go anywhere. Like, I'm from New York, right? That's another thing. Like, being from New York, oh, that's a whole other thing." So he's like, "I don't have to go anywhere. Like, I'm from New York." And I was like, "I was like, do you want to go to Haiti?" And he was like, "No." And I was like, see, like, that's where the disappointment was for me. Like, that's kind of where the shot came out. Um, and that's why I have the coconut trees kind of bursting out of the eyes. Um, because that was kind of my moment of thinking about that and connecting with that. Because, like, for me, um, to be honest, like, because of their history with Haiti, my grandparents would rather me not go to Haiti, right? But, like, I want to go. And for me, it means a lot to connect with the history there and to connect with, like, what it really means to be from there. Um, and it was just interesting to see that, that like, that's not how this next generation necessarily feels about things uh, because their experience is so different than mine is, right? So it was like, while my grandparents moved from Haiti, they moved and like, they came to America in the late 60s, really excited about the civil rights movement with a lot of other people from Haiti who did the same thing. So like, the, at the end of the day, the communities that we grew up around were very Haitian. Right, but like to them now, if their main means of and their main way of connecting with their friends are through these screens, then that's not necessarily that this that's not their priority, right? It's kind of like their identity in that way, and like the identities that they connect with are really more related to like their usernames and their screen names, and kind of like the online communities that they connect with. So it was just kind of also me working through that, um, kind of trying to understand that and having kind of some frustration. Right, like I think, um, you know, like even like what we talked about a lot, like you, you, you have to kind of play like every game, like you won't have another one, right? And so I think a lot of that was also why I really wanted to get across a lot of concepts that were deep to me. It's really just like, I don't know when I'll have this kind of, like this kind of opportunity even to like pay respects to like the family members that I did in this show again, like on this type of platform, right? Um, and so yeah, it just means a lot to me as well. And just also, um, I think the way that um, even kind of Kobe talks about playing basketball as a craft um, versus kind of like a sport or a game, um, is just really inspiring to me for a lot of what I do as well. So um, even being a 3D artist and a digital artist, like most of the work that I've done um, has been made for screens. But um, even like having the opportunity to like work at a museum and see a lot of studio artists like make a lot of a really amazing works on paper and see like the process of how deeply they, they really think about their art really challenged me to do the same. And so I think like even though I'm using digital art means, I really approached it like as much as I could uh, like a studio artist, right? Which is like very much so like a, a very different mentality, but I think it's something that uh, like that kind of thinking also like forced me to like up my game, right? So I think to make something um, for like an online platform where you pretty much are expecting someone to only look at something for like 10 seconds max versus like creating something that you want people to actually like think about forever. Um, it is really different. And I think a lot of that, um, like being able to kind of like enter those spaces, um, for me, I kind of like try to look at people who have done that in their own way and, and different kind of, you know, means. And even as you talked about with Kobe, like where he started, um, you know, like I, I was never really able to draw well. And so like for me, a lot of being able to work in a digital realm, like kind of like gave me the opportunity to like be in a space where I could like have some confidence and then be able to like create and grow and get better and kind of like see that own growth in myself. Um, so, I mean, like even in another way, like someone who I've studied like really deeply who's very similar is someone like Pharrell Williams, right? Like he always tells people, if you want to be a great musician, just keep trying and trying. Like I wasn't always great. Um, and so I think that that's just something that, like there's just a, a lot of people who I admire, are people who I think like work really hard um, and that's just something that I try to do as well, is like, just kind of be like, all right, like, if anything, I can work really hard.
Um, and I think that, um, and even with that as well, um, creating art that's in, that's in ends within itself, right? So I think like as a digital artist, a lot of what you're doing is to create a conversation, right? So getting likes or having comments on a piece, like that's the other part of it. But in a show like this, um, the pieces are the ends within themselves. Like that's that's the idea. That's where the conversation like starts, or 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 really that you just pose a, like you kind of get to decide um, what that is. And I think creating in a way uh, where you know the end is the success is also um, you know a challenge, but it's very it feels truer in a way. So. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned this thing about uh, not being a very good visual artist. Yeah. I was going to ask you about yeah. that, but I just want to kind of end this segment yeah. of the program by saying that when we first started working together, that's actually something you said to me, <laughs> you know, that uh, you didn't have that much skill yeah. in drawing or as a visual artist. So that makes it especially um, fascinating to kind of see the art that's here to, uh, you know, today that's striking, that's artfully um, ex executed and um, very layered. So, um, Kat, do we have some time for some questions from the audience? And if so, how much? Um, okay. Yeah, let's do about 15 minutes of uh, hearing from the audience. It's a strange thing to call it. <laughs> Linda. Um, Mark, congratulations on uh, creating art that makes us think and um, starts a conversation. So, I could I have a lot of questions, but I'll, I'll just focus on two things. So. Um, I'm struck by this one. A lot of your art is um, more focused on males, and this is obviously a female on Sugar Hill. Is, I grew up in New York also, so I, that's a place in Harlem as well as yeah, yeah. a movie, so I'm familiar with that. And the other one I wanted to ask you about is the one over here, Between the World and Me, your digital piece, yes. and um, uh, which is the Flavio yeah, um, you know, the story of this, this one, yeah. just about your, your technical process of how you created it. I was, I was very curious about that. Okay, so uh, so with this piece, so uh, so totally like right on money with both. Uh, definitely referencing the film. Um, definitely, definitely referencing you know Harlem, the neighborhood, all of that. Um, so this piece for me, it's so it's kind of like a double thing. So it's in this series as well of pieces um, that are kind of like I guess like my waiting series. <laughs> if you will. Um, the first thing that I would just kind of like note about it that I did that probably people really wouldn't pick up on um, is the fact that her, uh, like her wings are the most active. Um, and that's because there's kind of this idea for me where this is really kind of like an amalgamation of my grandmother's, right? So like even the way that that she's kind of like dressed and kind of like the, just kind of like there are different notes uh, for me that are kind of like really important now. Like both of my grandmothers are very dramatic and they like wore like a lot of fur. They were definitely like, you know, big into that. So, um, and so kind of the activation in the wings there is kind of this way of like me kind of saying um, that like, like y'all knew how to fly and y'all are with me, but like I don't know how to fly, right? <laughs> and so that's kind of like this also this way of me of kind of like dealing with that for myself. Um, and so the film Sugar Hill. Once again, kind of combining um, my grandmother's, um, I guess, embodiments, right? So in the film, um, you know, the, the main character kind of takes over Harlem using voodoo, essentially, right? And so this idea, I think, that like voodoo, which is very much tied to like Haitian culture and history, can be something that kind of like takes over New York City. I think is a very interesting thing to think about as like a Haitian American and to kind of tie to our history there. Um, and then my other grandmother, she really like they lived in the Bronx, but for those in the Bronx, especially like who were a part of her generation, Harlem and the Bronx were essentially like connected communities that really had like a very like lively connection to each other and very competitive, but also like the community really was a lot about people in the Bronx and people in Harlem kind of coming together in a lot of those ways. Um, so that's where the reference from Sugar Hill comes from, like very much so thinking about a lot of those histories um, and who they were and kind of thinking about them in that sense. The other kind of film title that's covered up at the top um, is a film Venus and Furs, which is also, you know, like the song Venus and Furs. And I just thought um, on that original poster, um, 
the woman who was kind of on there is like very like Eurocentric. So I just thought it was fun to just like throw my grandmother's on top of that and just like roll with that and just let it be that. So that was kind of like a thing for me there. And then once again, like the rated X sign is just um, really just throwing a nod back to like once again that that time period of film that's also like very much like an influence on me as well and really is also like a huge influence on like hip hop culture as well. So just once again like bringing that full circle and really like embracing that. Um, for the video pieces that are on the wall there, um, so those begin, um, I got kind of referenced earlier um, with the trip I took to Japan where I was able to get myself 3D scanned. I've been work I've been working in 3D for for a long time, but I mean like really definitely um, pretty focused on 3D heavily probably since like 2011, um, kind of like almost like exclusively. But um, and so like I've worked in scans of other people, I've done stuff like that. Um, but I had the opportunity when I got to Tokyo to um, to get myself scanned, and so it started with that process, um, and now kind of like having those files and being able to do that. Um, you know, kind of really opened up, I would say, like a lot of what I've been, I think, searching for a lot in my process of working in 3D. I had made, like even, so for instance, like this G print is a piece um, that I probably started in like 2015 and have kind of like reiterated like um, throughout the years. But um, so in a lot of ways, like I, when I made stuff like this, I was very much trying to reflect myself and so I think um, once I really had the ability to kind of like work with myself, I felt like I could actually kind of like really start to tap into that. And um, you know, even in a way like as I worked on stuff like this, um, which was very true to me, it also would still feel like very passive at the same time because it was like, but I'm saying this, like it's really about something that's like very true to me. Um, and I feel like if I'm gonna speak on things that are daring, then I should be able to like take that liberty and be able to like be real about it that this is me and this is how I'm feeling. Um, so that's what a lot of that is about. And um, I really just use like a bunch of different computer programs to make stuff. I really don't, um, I usually don't like kind of stay in one thing. Like I use everything from like 3D programs to like traditional like video editing programs. Um, and really for me, it's just kind of about mixing things together and not really getting um, also at the same time too caught up in any process. I think it's more about like me thinking through like where I want to go with it as like as an end and then just like getting there somehow and not really kind of getting like too caught up in any like one thing because in this digital world things just change so much and like while one thing might be the best program to use today something else could be the best program to use tomorrow um, so I kind of like to keep my relationship with anything in particular the same way. Can I say a hand over there? Nope. Oh. Anybody else? Oh. I mean, you know me, you're not going to be surprised by this question, but like, I am curious about how your use of words and logos has changed. Because like, I saw some of your previous work, and it was kind of about like questioning logos and yeah. brands. Yeah, yeah. And then this has taken it to a different kind of place. So like, what are you, what's your thoughts about it? Yeah, you know, the thing is, like, I think, um, I think a lot of my question about, like, the use of, like, logos or even, like, advertising, um, for me, is, like, fairly complicated, like, as you know, like, I mean, like, we work together, like, working in marketing, working in branding is kind of, like, this double kind of thing there where it's, like, I understand, like, you know, like, the evilness and everything that comes with it, but then there's just a lot of brands that I just think are, like, really cool, and, like, there are certain, like, brands and stories that I feel um, can kind of represent me um, in a certain way as well, so it's kind of, like, once again, kind of, like, dealing with that duality, thinking about that balance, um, but honestly, when it comes to my own art, I think, um, I feel like the more that I also like was able to learn about art and be educated about stuff, I also started to feel like um, for right now, a lot of the people who like really think about brandalism and are really thinking about like the use of advertising or logos and art are actually like talking about it on a totally different level than I was. So I think it was also about like learning about stuff and being like, oh, okay, I guess when I come back to this, um, I should probably have something better to say. Um, but I think, so I think sometimes, uh, I think a lot of these pieces, um, the way that I handled, I think probably a lot of brands were uh, like me actually like 
I think this relates to hip hop too, is actually like trying to be like real with myself. So I was like, I didn't want to like have clothes on in these pieces that like I don't really own and I didn't want to like represent something that like I didn't really have. And that really is just like, that's just like very stubborn hip hop thinking actually at the end of the day more than anything else. But um, I think working through that kind of process once again, I mean, especially this being one of the, I mean, this being the first time um, this series being the first time that I really was working in self-portraits and also printing pieces um, of, of like this size and this quality, um, I think it was important for me to, to like actually like keep it as real as possible. And I think in this way, um, like brands like Supreme or like Off-White or like Polo or something like that, um, those have like very specific um, like histories to me, right? And so like, Polos like that once again that relates to like growing up in New York. Like I grew up around a lot of people that they call like low heads who are like collectors of polo and like those are some of the first like in my opinion like some of the first people that really did like streetwear, right? And like they were very serious about collecting like rare and hard to find Ralph Lauren um for just like kind of in competition with each other, but also like in a way to like uplift each other and have community and to like that was their way of kind of like having a culture. Um, that was beyond like whatever, like drug dealing or like whatever, like just being with, doing whatever they were doing, like a way to live above that. Um, and so like when I would go to Harlem a lot, like I would see a lot of these people and like I would see them at like basketball games where they were like wearing their rarest and best stuff to also like show that like they have humanity, right? Like they understand how to be a tastemaker. They understand like how to present themselves and to like create art and to be like walking art in that way. Um, and so those kind of like brands are real to me, like brands like Supreme, um, like, you know, like I was growing up in the era when like, I remember like the first time we really saw Supreme was like in the film Kids. And like, we were like in a similar age group and like, oh, like that's the, like, who's that, like, who's the cool black dude named Harold Hunter and Kids who then like everybody else wanted to be like, because it was like, he's just a cool black dude who, who got in the milk, like the movie, like coolest movie that came out. Um, and he was like close enough to people like I would like be skating around and I would like see people like that right so like um, like I remember like when the like Supreme Store was made so that people could skate in and out of it um, so like as these like things kind of like grow and have a different like global sense these are like also like very real um, and important things to me like uh, as a person so that's how I think more than anything, my use of brands has changed, especially as it relates to um, to this exhibition. Like I think before, I was more, like I said, kind of interested in ideas of like, you know, like anti-capitalism and stuff like that, where I think now, um, I think maybe in search of trying to find a more sophisticated way of dealing with that, um, I'm instead kind of like thinking about these histories of brands that maybe have like empowered me in a way. Yeah, one of the artists that you turned me on to, I think that um, um, Mac. Um, oh yeah, um, Mac Hami. Yeah, yeah, Mac yeah. Hami. I think that the piece that I heard from him was actually the yeah. title was is is it brand? Yeah. Um, yeah. So the title is brand name. Yeah. Um, and so and like brand so brand name is the same song that inspired that piece because um, like the last few bars are like he's just like hey flag on my face and then he like describes the flag and. Um, well, he's a really just important like underground rapper in general. Um, people kind of know about underground rap. I mean, like this is a very crude comparison, but I would say that like if there's like MF Doom, who's kind of like considered like the like greatest underground rapper, like Mahami is probably like the next like like evolution of that in a way that's kind of like more modern and like the way that he's approaching things. Um, so like once again, just like a really big influence, and yeah, the song brand name. Um, where he's very much so kind of like talking about these same topics and he just kind of like is using the idea of brand names to like talk about like, you know, like like things that are happening in the streets as far as crime, but then also at the same time, like his connection to like understanding like lack. So it's just like, you know, the ability to kind of like, um, you know, kind of like use brands and like these things to then like kind of like also you know, show like as a symbol to strive for something more. Like for instance, that's like one of the most popular like um, like polo collecting, you know, like like Instagram pages. It's literally like all we rock is low symbols, right? So it's like this idea of like symbols like once again and like, you know, like visual semantics 
I think, kind of like relating through that. I think we have time for one more question. Yes. Yes. Okay. So. Um, so it's the piece "Mother as Object." Um, that's over there on the far, on the uh, far wall corner there. Um, so that is probably the piece that more so than anything else is um, directly related to a lot of my interest in philosophy. And so, um, in a lot of ways, there, there. So there's Freud, right? Who's had like a bunch of different theories about a lot of things that are that range from everything to like sexuality to like you know just like subconsciousness um, and so this idea of mother as object is interesting because it, what it essentially tried to do as a theory was try to understand sexism and what it essentially said was that men go through this issue during their development where first they think of themselves as their mother, and then they don't understand that they're not their mother until they see their father, and then they identify as their father, and then they start to objectify their mother. So it's just this process where, um, it's just a theory that says this is where sexism comes from. Um, I don't necessarily believe that theory, but I think that it's interesting to think about the possibility that a lot of people are just naturally sexist, and that's really sad. And that um, if, as a culture, we have to purposely um, deprogram ourselves from sexism, then we should probably start to do that as quick as possible, if that is the case. Um, so yeah, it's just kind of thinking about that. So it's not a cosign, but more so just something to think about and to think about, um, you know, our own kind of biases and where they really come from as as a real group um, of possibly who we are. Again, I just want to say how, you know, that really shows the depth and the layers in this um, this exhibit, right? And we could spend hours talking about that. Of course, we will not. Um, but, I want, but I want to thank the um, Swim Gallery and the Luggage Store for making this happen. And of course, Mark for uh, creating this, this, this work, which I uh, hope a lot, you know, it opens up so much uh, conversation um, that the work references. Um, and so before we uh, break, I just want to ask you if there's anything else you want to say before we uh... No, just thank you all for being here. Um, this has been like awesome. Just like, thank you for listening to me. Um, you know, if you disagree with me, just let me know personally. <laughs> um, you know, um, yeah, thank you. No, thank you. Yeah, thank you all for real. It, this has been really fun. Great. Thanks for being here.